God damn it. I can figure out. I, I, I'm trying to like up the quality of the video part of this whole thing. And I got all these cameras. I don't have the proper lights though. I have the incorrect kind of lights and it's, it's taken me forever to figure out what to do with this. I'm sure it's going to look a lot better than anything else I've done on this show. Before. That is probably true. Yes. <laughs> but that's not the standard that I want to set for myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I don't know where this conversation is going to go eventually because uh, it looks like we could talk about many different things, but the starting point is clear. The starting point is the book that you just published online for free. You did it yourself. And it's available on mindbodyproblems.com. And it's a great book. And I know that because, you know, it just came out. And so not many people have read it, but I've read it earlier because I got to do the illustrations for the book. So I, I want to thank you one more time for that because that was a lot of fun. And that's something that I haven't done before. Oh, thank you. Your art really added a lot to the book. That, that made it a lot more fun for me to to have that element introduced. Well, good. So thank good. you. So it's a mutual, mutual thing. Um, yeah. I realized, you know, I was awaiting its uh, release. And then when it's, once it was out, I realized I don't know what's hap what happens next. And I'm not even sure if you know what happens next, because this is like you, you've done it differently uh, with all of your previous books. Yeah, so um, maybe I should explain why I decided to to publish it this way. So I've published four books with publishers. Mm -hmm. My first three books, I went the conventional route. I, I had an agent and I, I wrote a proposal uh, for what kind of book I wanted to write. I'd give it to the agent. The agent would go out and try to find somebody to give me money in advance mm -hmm. to write the book. And that worked pretty well for my first three books. Um, but my, my second and third book, didn't I got pretty big advances and they didn't pay back their advances. The publishers lost money on them. Hmm. So the publishers eventually um, catch on. Uh, they're not that stupid. And uh, for my fourth book, The End of War, I had a really hard time finding a publisher. My agent and I split up over it. He didn't want me to write this ridiculous hippie book that uh, we could have world peace someday. Hmm. And uh, so then I was trying to figure out what book I would write next. My girlfriend, who's in publishing, in publishing and film, was really pushing me. By the way, I call her em Emily in yeah. the book. That's a pseudonym. She was pushing me to write a commercial book. She said, okay, it's time for you to, you know, you got this war book out of your system. Mm -hmm. So write something that people are actually going to want to read. And, um, and I, you know, I wanted to get back in the game of real commercial publishing too. Um, and uh, so I came up with this idea. I started going to a lot of conferences on uh, consciousness and the mind-body problem. And I came up with this idea to write a book about how our subjective experiences, um, the, uh, the good and bad things that happen to us, affect how we view these old problems, like the problem of consciousness and, and uh, free will and, and the meaning of life. And I thought, I it would be interesting to write it as a series of profiles to dramatize the idea by, by showing how these major mind-body thinkers have been influenced by, for the most part, pretty bad things that had happened to them. Uh, the collapse of a marriage, um, mental illness, severe mental illness in a couple of cases that leads to uh, psychosis and hospitalization, a brain tumor in one case. Um, one of my subjects, uh, an economist named Deirdre McCloskey, uh, discovered when she was in her 50s, she was married and had two children, that she was actually a woman. Uh, before that, she had been Donald McCloskey. And so I thought this was a fantastic idea with a lot of commercial potential. I, um, because also I just love to write profiles. I think it's one of my strengths as a writer. So I figured, you know, this, this, couldn't, this couldn't lose. And I ran it by a few agents. And, uh, and the response was, was not good. No, they, they really didn't see any potential in this at all. My girlfriend 
also wasn't so keen on the on the idea. She didn't. She'd never heard of the phrase mind body problem. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it's it's actually quite obscure. But I just decided to write the damn book anyway. I, I was so I was so um, into the idea by this time that I just wanted to keep keep going. And the reason I could do that is because I have a teaching job. Mm -hmm. I, I teach at a university, Stevens Institute of Technology, that pays me pretty well. And it's changed my relationship with writing in a really dramatic way. I write for fun now, instead of writing to make a living to support myself and uh, my family. So it's very, it's very liberating, maybe too liberating. Um, but uh, I just went ahead and decided to write the book. When I was finished with it, um, I, I really started wrapping it up last spring and I had a draft I was pretty happy with. I, I ran it by one editor who had expressed interest in my work before. And uh, he wasn't, he couldn't get, he told me he couldn't get through the first chapter. So that was really depressing. And then I thought at some point, I'm just gonna publish this myself. Um, I had run into a computer scientist at a uh, little conference I went to in San Francisco, who had self-published a book, uh, and um, a lot of people had read it. He just had a little donate button, and people had given him quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that sounded like a pretty good scheme. So I, I would publish it for free. People um, can give me some money if, if I like. If they don't, uh, that's fine too. Um, so I see this thing as an experiment, Another great thing about self-publishing, and by the way, I have a cold. I just took a Sudafed before this conversation, and I feel like I just smoked crack. I mean, I'm I'm flying high, so that so you know you're, you're probably gonna have you're you're gonna have to deal with me being even more garrulous than usual. But I think um, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I realized that I could I, I was I could do anything I wanted if I posted if I published it myself online. I could add photographs, I could add video links, uh, I could take little snippets, audio snippets from uh, interviews and add those to the end of the chapter so people could hear what my subjects actually uh, talked about. A crucial um, idea was to add art. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, originally I, I, I approached you, I think, just to create a cover image of a, a, some kind of knot. And then you came up with this fantastic idea of a knot that consisted of my name and the names of my nine subjects all woven together with the title of the book in different psychedelic colors, which is just love that. It's so cool. It just embodies the book. And then, and then at some point you said, you know, you're sort of getting into the chapters and you wanted to give a shot at creating mm -hmm. art for each individual chapter. And that also, represents the book because each piece of art you created for each different person um, is so different from all the others, which is one of the themes of the book that our lives are all so different. So of course, when we try to answer the mind body problem, which is really the question of who we really are, our answers are going to be all over the place. They're going to, to diverge. Right. I, I think, I think you're kind of in the zeitgeist with this book, uh, because this is kind of my theory that, I mean, it's not an original theory, but not everybody agrees with that, but I, I feel really strongly about that, that the, just the technological change that we have now, these podcasts, for example, podcasts are becoming a bigger and bigger medium and, you know, more than newspapers or television or anything, like if you get on the Joe Rogan experience, that is a big break for you. And the Joe Rogan experience is like three hours of talking about everything with this one weird dude. And when he invites, like if you see the same person on you know, a little TV segment or even in print most of the time, like an expert on this or scientist or whatever, they, you get a sense that, oh, this is the expert. This is the person to listen to and he has the answers. If you hear anybody talk for three hours about anything, it will eventually, every time without fail it ter will turn out that that's just a fucking person and they they <laughs> they have some you know authority on in this area and a little less authority in this other area and then they'll 
inevitably say something that you will go, oh, that they don't, un- don't understand or, or don't know. And so it, right. it humanizes them. And, it make, and to me, it makes their theories actually more compelling because it's like if I'm presented with the truth and the expert, I immediately have some reservations about whatever they're going to say. But if I'm presented with a person who has a biography, who has a life, who has, you know, kinks in their uh, just trajectory of their life, and you see how that's connected to the message that they're, you know, putting forth, that actually makes the message more compelling because you can relate to it on a personal level and you can see that it, it comes from, you know, their experience and their, they, they, they've actually struggled with these ideas and came out, this is their sincere take, but that's a person's take. That's just one out of seven or how many uh, billions we have now. I like that. Um, yeah, I, th- I think you're right. It, it makes me, it, it's, it's sort of a nice gloss on the kind of journalism I've been doing for a long time now. So in the end of science, I had these profiles of scientists and philosophers and, uh, you know, I was pretty mean to some of them. If I thought that their their egos, if they were a little bit too um, too arrogant, I would try to take them down a little bit. Um, and I enjoyed doing that. I just uh, reposted a piece that I did, uh, a profile at, that I did of uh, Karl Popper for the end of science. Mm-hmm. I posted it uh, last month. And um, a lot of people have been chatting about that now. And and you know, I show that Popper was this kind of contradictory figure. That he was anti-dogmatic, but um, as a philosopher, he preached against certainty. But he himself was this incredibly arrogant guy who would pound the table when he was making points, and uh, would talk about his critics as though they were total idiots. And that, to me, is fascinating. That the paradox of the skeptic who's unable to be skeptical of himself. Mm-hmm. I think. I, you know, I'm just agreeing with you that the, the ideas become richer and more interesting if you understand the context in which they arise, what this person was trying to accomplish. And of course, there are always, there are emotions and, and insecurities, fear and desire that is motivating some of these great idea, ideas. And to, to disembody the ideas right. and treat them out of that context I think it doesn't do justice to them. So I I had that idea behind the journalism I did for a long time, but I really decided to go all the way with it. I think it would have worked out great. I I mean, to be honest with you, when I like started reading the book, I thought I'm going to treat it as, you know, it's a a gig. You know, I'm going to read this book because I need to produce the art. And I was completely taken away by it. it. It's a great, great book. And, and this humanizing part of that, of it, uh, to me, was the most kind of precious one. So how do you choose, well, I guess a two-part question. First, how do you pose the question for yourself, the central question of the book? Like you say, the mind-body problem, but it actually, as the title suggests, it's a whole bunch of different problems tied together. So first part of the question is, what are these uh, questions that you tried answering? And the second is, how did you choose the subject and why did you choose those people, not others? Yeah, so I'll start by just trying to say what I mean by the mind-body problem. Uh, the, The phrase is often associated with the problem of consciousness. So in a kind of narrow technical sense, it's about how matter more specifically, the brain generates a mind, generates um, mental states. Uh, but the mind-body problem is really about all the different puzzles that are related to, to the mind and to humanity. So it also encompasses free will. It's a puzzle how free will arises out of matter. Um, it encompasses morality. So how, how do we go from a physical... Uh, universe to a, a universe where there's this concept uh, of ought and should. Mm-hmm. That's a big puzzle. Um, the meaning of life. Where does the concept of meaning and purpose um, arise in a strictly 
physical universe as well. So a lot of these problems became acute and they really came to the attention of philosophers and scientists just over the last 150 years or so with the, the rise of very materialistic science. But the way I like to, or, to think about the mind-body problem is that it's really just about what we are and, and how we see ourselves. And this question um, has bothered people since the beginning of time. All religions are a response to the mind-body problem. If you think of it as, what are we? Yeah. Uh, philosophy, all art, literature is a response to that problem. Trying to figure out what it means to be a human being and, and what it means to be a good person and what constitutes a good, meaningful life. So it's, it's really, it's this giant mess <laughs> of interconnected uh, problems, but that can be summarized very simply under this one question, what are we really? And what are we? And that leads to what can we be because of science, because science is constantly giving these technologies um, that allow us to modify ourselves possibly. And what should we be? So if we have all the, if we have genetic engineering and brain implants and, oh, I think that's a handyman who just came. <laughs> yeah, somebody, I've got a big hole in my, in the ceiling of my bathroom. And um, this guy was coming to, to patch it, but uh, I told him to come back later. Um, so th the mind-body problem is, it, it's just to complicate it even more, um, it's, it's about personal identity. So each person has to try to figure out what he or she um, really is. And that involves uh, uh, sexuality, which ended up being a part of some of my, uh, some of my interviews. Uh, but the mind-body problem is also about what we are as a species. Mm -hmm. How do we think of ourselves, and what you know, what, where are we going as a species, and and um, is is there any is there any overarching purpose to it? Which again is a question that is addressed traditionally by uh, religion. Um, and uh, you know, see, these are these are the deepest questions that there are, and um, and so. Uh, I, part of what I was trying to do in the book is find people who had really wrestled with at least one or more of these questions um, and also had some, that their personal lives had posed some uh, problems that you could consider mind-body problems, like mental illness, mm -hmm. uh, like a brain tumor, like sexual confusion. Uh, one person... Uh, Alison Gopnik had a midlife crisis in which um, her marriage collapsed and suddenly she realized she was bisexual. She'd never considered that before until suddenly she found herself uh, making love with a woman for the first time. As I said before, the economist Deirdre McCloskey suddenly decided that uh, she was uh, a woman after spending 50 years as, uh, as a man. Um, I, I wanted to find people who, whose personal lives had lots of rich material for storytelling and whose theories um, also were intertwined or entangled with their personal lives uh, in some way. So I actually had a whole bunch of people I considered um, and then narrowed it down to the, uh, to the nine people that I included in the book. I had to find people also willing to submit to my questions, my, my nosiness. Was that difficult? About, um, some of them had already written about mm -hmm. their problems, um, or some of them I had heard that they had undergone gone problems. And, um, and some of them turned me down, didn't want to get into it. Uh, but, uh, but the people, you know, the nine people who eventually agreed to do this just decided for whatever reason that um, you know, they had to trust me to uh, to write about the, their most intimate secrets um, in a way that <laughs> wouldn't be distressing to them. So I think it's worked out. All of them have seen the book now and have reacted to it, and nobody is horrified and demanding that I take their chapter down. So so far, so good. Was there somebody who was mildly unhappy with it? Well, um, the person that I was most worried about 
was the evolutionary biologist, Robert Trivers. I had a very intense uh, encounter with him. He, he lives in Jamaica in this house on the top of a mountain. And, uh, and I, surrounded by jungle, and I decided that it would be fun to take my girlfriend down there and, and spend the night with him. And, um, and he's a difficult person. He's, he's uh, been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And he's got a pretty severe temper. I've met him before. Um, and uh, he told me about, and he's also, this is one of the themes of the piece. He's got this sort of affinity for violence, for violent people and violent situations. And, um, and so I, I, you know, I wrote about that. And I wrote about his mental illness and um, about the struggles that he has had in his life. And I was really worried about his reaction in part because I admire him so much. He's one of the greatest scientists who ever lived, mm -hmm. Robert Trivers. He, he helped to solve the problem of altruism. Why are humans nice to each other to the extent that they are? Uh, but um, he seems to have, he didn't lavish praise on me, but uh, he didn't react with, um, with hostility. Uh, so that makes me very happy. His was my favorite chapter. It's a really rich kind of portrait, you know, the 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 whole circumstance, the jungles in Jamaica, and the and there is the political dimension to it. And he's a member of the Black Panthers. It's a, a really compelling read. Even if you're not into evolutionary biology, that's just a good story. Well, I I love trying to find paradoxes or contradictions in great thinkers, and the wonderful paradox that I found in Trivers is that he is, uh, he's an authority on deception and self-deception. He wrote a book called The Folly of Fools that was about uh, deception in the animal kingdom and about why that arose, the evolutionary uh, benefits, and then self-deception in uh, humans, which is a very important part of our psyches and he had really brilliant insights into uh, how self-deception arose and what purpose it serves basically it's that lying is difficult lying requires an expenditure of uh, energy uh, some people are really good at lying but I myself am a terrible liar and I, I'm you know my brain is on fire if I'm trying to get away with uh, a lie and so Trevor says that it actually makes sense for evolution to design us so that we can deceive ourselves because then we lie more mm, effectively. Mm -hmm. And also there's all this stuff going on below the, the level of our own awareness. I mean, this is something that uh, Freud has talked about a lot. And yet Trivers, of course, himself, he's this really hot-blooded guy. Um, he, he acknowledges uh, that he is very prone to self-deception. And there are big blind spots in his own ability to uh, understand himself. So I found that, you know, that was, that ended up being a theme of that chapter. And I found that fascinating. And I think that applies to humanity in general. Right. That, you know, we're so smart. We're so brilliant. We're, we're uncovering the secrets of the universe. We're looking out um, at the very edges of the universe. And we've completely explored everything here on earth. And we've, understood our, our genome, and yet we're so clueless still about ourselves. If you look at American politics, you can see just what foolish apes we are, essentially. You don't have to qualify American politics. Politics generally, I think, is a, is a pretty big mess. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it was just wonderful to me that Trivers, this scientist, mm -hmm was focused so much on these, these um, dark aspects of, of human nature, embodies them himself. So, um, yeah, I like that chapter too. Well, it makes sense that, again, I, I think, it, I mean, I'm repeating myself, but I really think this is a great uh, central point of the book, that there is a connection between what the person, the, the reality that the person lives in, the way he or she describes that reality and the theories they produce about that reality and you know their personal lives because everybody's reality is shaped by their lives yeah. jordan peterson is a big name now and he everybody's talking about the message that he's putting forward and 
it's interesting, but I don't understand why, you know, he's, he's done like a million interviews and not one interviewer asked him about like his relationship to his mother or something like that. Because he has, <laughs> like, I listened to a conversation between him and Rogan, I think, and Peterson always, he has this very dramatic way of putting things and he was talking about kind of his ideas for self-improvement. And it always starts with some like, you need to transcend your miserable, wretched self. And Rogan <laughs> goes, why do you, does it have to be miserable and wretched? What if, what if I'm doing okay, but I could be doing better? And Peterson had an answer to that, which, you know, a reasonable answer. He said that if you're trying to work out, you know, a way to improve things, it has to work in the worst case scenario. But that is, for my money, rationalization, because the, the actual reason that his theory starts with that in that spot is because he struggled with clinical depression for his whole life. And he's had uh, autoimmune illness and his family has gone through uh, horrible illness as well. And he's just generally an intense guy, really into history of the 20th century. If you study, you know, Nazism and Bolshevism for, uh, you know, more than a year, you're going to get, your view of the world is going to get darker than when you started. And then you add Nietzsche and Dostoevsky to it. And then, so it's not, it's not that that invalidates what he says, sure. but it makes... I think it should be a part of the kind of presentation because then you have more context and you understand better where this person is coming from. And again, to me, that makes anybody's worldview actually more compelling when you understand that it's not just a person, you know, thought this things, these things up. It comes from an experience, from their life, uh, you know, struggles or pleasures or whatever. Yeah, an experience of suffering. Um, well, so that reminds me of a chapter. Um, the second chapter in the book is about Douglas Hofstadter, mm -hmm. who was uh, somebody who had a big impact on me. I first read his book, Gertel Escher Bach, in the early 80s, and I, I started reading his columns for Scientific American. And um, he seemed almost like a superhuman figure. He was obviously brilliant, but he wrote about the world with joy and uh, pointed out all these um, beautiful, magical aspects of the world that sometimes required very close attention and some knowledge of, of uh, physics and biology and, uh, and mathematics. And it was extraordinary to me. I th always thought of him as a very trippy writer, mm -hmm. uh, um, somebody who um, was on a permanent acid trip and then just, just seen all these marvels around him and had the incredible talent to convey those marvels through his writing. And then actually say some very deep things about the structure of reality and, and how minds work. And so I was really looking forward to meeting him. He agreed to, uh, to speak to me. And I knew that he had had some sorrow in his life, uh, that he had a uh, wife who had died very suddenly in her, in her um, 40s. It had a big impact on him. But I still thought I was going to encounter this, uh, this happy person, more than happy, a joyful person. And he turned out to be somebody who is very melancholy and has a very dark view of the world and sees a lot of ugliness. Uh, and his, I see his writing as, as a, like a reaction to all that darkness and ugliness. Mm. And that to me, to me made what he has achieved even more remarkable, knowing how much he had to overcome to, to write Gertel Escher Bach and I Am a Strange Loop and these wonderful columns for Scientific American that are filled with all this wordplay and scientific puzzles and, and, uh, and puns, that he has done that in spite of um, you know, depression or, or melancholy or whatever you want to call it, that is justified by the very real horror. This isn't pathological. He, he just sees a lot of the stuff that the rest of us deny. I certainly deny. 
you know, I've got a, I, I, I think I'm, I'm almost pathologically cheerful sometimes in my approach to life I, because I just try to deny a lot of stuff. And Hofstadter looks at it very squarely. Mm -hmm. So I really admire that as well. And I'm hoping that people who are already fans of his work will appreciate it more after they read my chapter about him. How did you feel writing about, like, like for example, you said you, do, you were worried about Trevor's reaction to the chapter. What's the general feeling of having to tell somebody else's story? Like, that's a pretty heavy responsibility. It is. Um, I'm, I'm actually always astonished that anybody wants to talk to me. Uh, but um, I think so, for some people, maybe it's difficult to tell their own stories. Mm. And some of, some of my subjects had written about themselves, but maybe there are certain things that they held back and they told me and they wanted to get, to get these things out there. And maybe they were curious to see what my take on them was. My, my, the, the subject of chapter one, Christoph Koch, K-O-C-H, sometimes I pronounce it Koch or Koch or Koch or Koch. Anyway, I'll, I'll stick with Koch. Um, this great neuroscientist, I've known him since uh, the very early 1990s. And um, he was the person who gave me the idea for the book, really, because, um, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, he switched from being a hardcore materialist basically um, carrying forward the idea, uh, the ideas of Francis Crick, you know, the, the great discoverer of the, the double helix, hardcore materialist and atheist who said that what we are is basically just a, a bunch of neurons. Um, that was a quote from his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis. And the way to understand consciousness and free will and the self and all these things is just with nitty gritty studies of the brain. Uh, getting into the uh, hardware. And so um, Koch went with that for many years and Crick died and then he had a, uh, a crisis of faith. He'd been a, a Catholic, he lost that faith, his marriage fell apart and he glommed onto this new theory called integrated information theory, a theory of consciousness with dramatic implications. It suggests that consciousness pervades the entire universe, all matter. Uh, so this is a form of, of panpsychism, this ancient mystical idea. And, um, and I, you know, I, I talked to, um, the Coke, I, I went out to Seattle and interviewed him and he gave me all his reasons for why this is a really great theory. And then I, in my piece, I, I psychoanalyzed him and said that he was, um, my take on him was that he's really, he's, he's feeling the chill of mortality. And strict materialism is kind of boring and um, anticlimactic. Mm. Uh, and I, he wanted more out of science. And I thought for the same reason that his marriage collapsed, uh, that he, he became restless in his marriage, he became restless as a scientist and glob, glommed on to this, uh, this sexy theory with all these amazing implications that went way beyond any kind of conventional um, materialism. And Christoph, actually, now that I remember it, he's seen the book, but he hasn't reacted specifically to the chat. I don't know if he'll be annoyed with my psychoanalysis of him saying that, you know, his, his not fear of death, because this is one of the most cheerful people I've ever met. Uh, but just his realization that he doesn't have that much time left, mm -hmm. that this is what's driven him to go after a, a very dramatic theory that, um, that really can solve all these different puzzles related to consciousness. Uh, so, you know, he'll probably disagree with me, but um, then he has the option of, of writing, writing me and telling me why, why I'm wrong and I can post it at the end of my book in the comments section. You should talk. I think this is one of the things that I, I have a, a small kind of a mission to try to convince you that, well, my original thought was, never, I think I wrote you in an email that I think it would be great if you produce an audio version of this book because audio is, I think, a more personal kind of intimate medium because you hear the 
person's voice and there's a cadence to how they speak and there is you know size and pauses and everything and the book is personal both in terms of your own like throughout these nine chapters you put a little bit of yourself in each chapter and there is a kind of a narrative to the whole book about your own uh, views on on these questions and then each chapter is personal in regards to that particular person so that was my original thought when I was just reading the book I thought this would be great as an audio version but now that you're you know the book is out I think it would be a great thing to follow up with these people you know record a conversation have a podcast you know about these things and uh maybe I mean it's also it's such an expansive kind of question that you pose like when i asked you at the beginning of this conversation like what are the questions you are trying to address it's like all of them yeah and uh and this this idea of the finding the connections between uh you know what we are and what we think we are and our personal lives that's just a to me it's a great premise it's like a genre it's a premise for uh you know a, a great podcast that would work beautifully I I love that idea. Uh, maybe we could do it on uh, Meaning of Life TV. Uh, I I think some of my subjects would be up for that. Others, I'm not so sure. Some were but, on um, the site already. Like Cock, uh, Bob Bob Wright interviewed him, and I think uh-huh. he's not the only one. I forget now who else, but I think oh, Rebecca Goldstein. Rebecca Goldstein, right. I think also. Yeah. Had yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll ask them. By this point, they might be just totally sick of John Horgan, and I wouldn't blame them. But but um, maybe that's their you know their opportunity to get back at you because you've told their story. <laughs> now, but there's a difference again between a conversation and like a writer's rendition. Like you have a whole narrative about this guy and about that guy, and now they can, you know, contradict you in direct confrontation if confrontation is what they're you know <laughs> looking for. Yeah. Um, you know, what I like about that is that, I mean, the theme of the book is that this is, that there can't be any end mm-hmm. to our, our quest to figure out who we really are. We constantly change. Um, this happens to us on, on, on the level of um, our individual selves, and it also happens on, on the level of the entire species, in part because of the theories that we come up with to help us understand ourselves. Psychoanalysis changed us. Behaviorism changed us. Neuroscience is constantly changing us. Um, Genetics and the theory of evolution. In the same way that that great art and literature gives us different ideas about ourselves, how could there be any end to that process? So the idea of using the book as as sort of the starting point for a conversation. I love it, it's, it's what I had in mind, one of the attractions of putting the whole thing on the web. Mm-hmm. I've already posted several comments at the end of the book. Um, it's, what's funny is the first two people who responded were, one was a hardcore materialist named Tom Clark, with whom I've had an argument, friendly argument for a really long time over whether free will exists. And the other, um, he, he thinks no, I think yes. And the other is Deepak Chopra, uh, or idealist who thinks that mind is the, the foundation of everything. And so he's pitching, he says, yeah, nice book, John, but then makes a pitch for his idealism, which is related to quantum mechanics and, uh, and that sort of stuff. So I love that, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping that everybody who has their own favorite paradigm for understanding ourselves will make a case for it mm-hmm. and then if i want to i can respond but that's kind of yeah that's kind of the whole point do you have like a strategy for promoting the book for for more people to see it yeah um it's funny i, I heard from a, a a scholar who is has written nice things about me in the past he's a scholar who pays a lot of attention to scientific communication. And he said, oh, John, this is, um, this is, this is a great way of uh, brand building and, and, uh, 
and he wanted to see how how I um, sort of built on my reputation uh, with this book because I never feel like I know what I'm doing. Uh, and the idea that I have a brand that I'm out there promoting, it's, it seems uh, absurd to me, you know, because I always feel like I'm totally incompetent. I'm just kind of hacking away and, and, uh, and blundering around in, um, in the dark. I, you know, I have, I've got this blog for Scientific American, so I wrote about the book there. That, that helps out a little bit. I, um, you know, I know a lot of journalists and uh, scientists and I've sent it to people, the book to people who, um, who played some role in the book, who had in invited me to give a talk on the mind body problem or with whom I'd had discussions. So I'm, I'm just flailing around out there hoping that, uh, that I, I get some kind of reaction. I'm actually hoping, and, and here we are talking, I'm hoping that this helps. Part of the reason I asked that question is I would want to strengthen my pitch for a podcast as a continuation of the book because like books from my understanding generally don't go viral on the internet but video conversations yeah. like we're having now can and podcasts can and yeah so that's that's a great idea you're 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 a lot younger than I am so you're much more savvy when it comes to these kinds of things I I'm being a book writer can really break your heart. And so I'm actually, I, I've, I've always tried to manage my expectations and emotions so that I don't expect too much um, when a book goes out there. This particular book, I'm hoping that, that I'm more worried about the long term. I'm actually hoping that over the long run, people might discover it, even if they're not discovering it immediately within the next few weeks or, or months, that that I've always thought that good writing sells itself. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we'll see. And, you know, and if people, if people um, don't have a big response to it, uh, that's okay too. I really loved writing this book. It was so much fun. I loved working with you and Frankie Guarini, the guy who put together the, uh, the website. That was really fun. Um, I'm enjoying updating it now by posting comments on the site. And so, um, you know, that in itself, that in itself has, has been great. Oh, and by the way, you know, I have a donate button on the site. I have already made $35 and 97 cents. That's not a bad start. <laughs> yeah. I just got an $18 donation. So I was really psyched about that. I'm getting up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's for three years of work. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and this is, you know, I write for love. I always wrote for love, but now I really write almost entirely for love instead of uh, instead of for money. And it's just it's that's beautiful. It's great. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Now, as I said already, you are one of the subjects of the book. Really, um, have your own ideas about uh, this whole uh, conglomeration of questions changed in the course of writing the book? Yeah, um, I've, I think I've moved a little bit more towards, um, well, I used to be kind of a, a mean writer and, uh, and critical. And I, I always had this idea that what science does is you know that scientists are on the right track when they start converging on one way of looking at a problem. And, you know, this is what we would call a paradigm. And then even on um, an answer or set of answers um, to that problem. And that the more diversity you have in ideas, uh, the more immature the field is. So that means things aren't, aren't going well. And um, that was, that was one of the assumptions underlying um, certainly the end of science and my second book, The Un Undiscovered Mind. And now I, I've completely shifted on this. Now I see multiplicity of ideas as, as a wonderful manifestation of human diversity and imagination and, and uh, creativity. So instead of it being something that I mock, for example, um, you know, I, I went to this famous conference in Tucson on consciousness. 
Uh, I went in 1994 when I was uh, staff writer at Scientific American, and I returned in, in 2016 for the purposes of this book. And it's just a wild and wacky conference uh, with every possible ridiculous theory of consciousness that you can imagine, inspired by Buddhism and other uh, mystical traditions. And psychedelics are really big now. Um, machine learning, Bayes' theorem, psychoanalysis is still out there. And, uh, and I actually wrote a piece for Scientific American mocking this lack of convergence. But now I, I'm much more sympathetic toward that. I see, I see it as, I actually would worry about convergence. Mm -hmm. I think if all, a lot of scientists, sort of big authority figures started saying, this is the correct way to understand ourselves. I think that that, that is something to fear um, because it might, especially it's, if it's very persuasive, it might limit our, um, our future um, creative ideas about what we can do, not only how we see ourselves, but even what we can be and what we should be. Um, so that was probably the biggest change in my thinking. Also, I'm just much, much more, you know, I, I, I tried to show that some of my subjects and people in general, we should just cut each other more slack. Right. Everybody's trying so hard to figure, life is, it's not easy. Uh, I mean, it's actually been pretty easy for me, but even I have, have had, I've had some hard times. You know, I've had a marriage that collapsed. I've been clinically depressed in the past. Um, so, you know, I, I, I even talked to some people, one of my, one of my uh, subjects, Stuart Kaufman, who I've given a hard time to in the past, um, had a terrible trauma involving his teenage daughter uh, who was killed um, when she was only 13. And that led him to come up with a, a, a theory of mind that allows for paranormal phenomena because he actually had a, a vision of his daughter's death um, before, before it happened uh, that he considers to be a genuine paranormal experience. And in the old days, I would have thought, well, I would have felt bad for him, but I would have thought, well, obviously, you know, these emotional reasons discredit him and they show that he's not being entirely rational. Now I say, no, this is, these are absolutely legitimate reasons for arriving at, mm -hmm. at, a, at a theory, even though they are profoundly uh, emotional. Um, so I like to think I'm just a little bit nicer of a person than I used to be. <laughs> yeah, one of the, like the situation with Stuart Kaufman, like that's a direct experience that he had, right? That influenced his thinking. And I was thinking in, in preparation for this interview, one other thing that we, you and I wanted to talk about yeah. is psychedelics and your relationship yeah. to them. And I thought one of the most powerful thing about psychedelics is it's an experience. It's like, even if you, even if it's easy to rationalize what you've gone through, what you've seen or felt, there are like circumstances around the trip and you know, you did it, you know, wrong or correctly or whatever, or a person, somebody said something to you that influenced the trip. Still, if you like the, the experience that you talk about in the book was, am I putting this correctly? You felt that you were God and you were freaking out. Yes. That's pretty much it. And it's like, if you, if you have that, if you just like, that is a, a, what do you call it? A data point. Like that's something that you lived through. That's going to be very difficult to dismiss, even if there are legitimate reasons to dismiss it. I was thinking about it even like, even without touching these complicated subjects, you know, God and free will and everything. Like I used to go, I don't do that very often now, but I used to, regularly attend these like oppositional rallies in Russia, anti-Putin manifestations and whatnot. And I would go to one of those and I would, then I would come back and read about this event that I just was a part of. And without fail, it was always like, I feel like this person, the, like previously 
if I didn't go to a thing, like, like there was a time when I never attended anything like that and I would read reports about it and I thought I'm getting the information about how it went down. And then when I actually participated in some of them, it became very clear that what you're reading is like some guy who went to the same thing and he was one of 50,000 participants and you know each has a different perspective because even just based on where in the crowd you stand, people are gonna be more excited about that speaker or that speaker. You'll see more you know, nationalists or liberals. You'll see you'll have a different, you'll experience a different mood of the crowd. The police will look at you differently, maybe in one spot than in the other. And all of that contributes to your experience of that. But then, you know, what a reporter does is comes home and presents this experience of theirs as the actual situation, the actual truth of what happened. And it's never the same thing as what other 50,000 people experienced. Yeah, I, I, so when I went to journalism, uh, 82 and 83, to graduate school in journalism, 82 and 83 at Columbia. And, uh, you know, so there were a lot of very successful journalists who were teaching there. And we were taught that journalism, the, what the ideal we should aspire to is objectivity. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, figuring out the facts and reporting the, to those, those two uh, readers and getting out of the way as an individual yourself, not throwing up your, um, your own subjective sens- sensations. And then I, once I became a journalist, I realized how ridiculous that was. Um, and that, of course, I just in the stories that I choose, I'm imposing my own. Yeah, you can subjective. strive for objectivity, but you're probably not going to achieve it. Yeah, well, when I, when I decided, and I've sort of moved more in this direction, and this, and this book, I guess, Mind Body Problems is the epitome of it, is that I can be more, certainly more honest, and, and maybe more objective in a sense, if I'm upfront about my own subjectivity, if I'm telling people exactly why, hold on a second. Um, if I'm, if I'm telling people exactly why um, I'm reacting to this particular idea or, or this theorist in a negative way or positive way, uh, to try to be completely transparent, which of course is impossible, but that's my ideal now, is to uh, try to reveal as much as my, of myself as possible. Now that can be really tedious for some readers. Uh, you know, it can come across as being very self-indulgent and. And sometimes I, as a reader, want just to be given the facts, and I don't want all this sort of hand waving of the uh, of the narrator in the front. But just going back to psychedelics, I think you know I've had some really wild experiences, and you, you mentioned this one, which I've written about, where I felt like I became God, and I discovered the secret of the universe that you know God is really fucked up, really neurotic, and that's why the universe is so fucked up. Um, but the the takeaway that's mattered the most to me is that this is what I, I, I call uh, the weirdness, that reality is just so bizarre. It's so impossible, uh, improbable. Um, there really is no reason for us to be here, and yet here we are. It, it's, it's the improbability, improbability of ourselves as individuals. Like, why am I this thing and not some other thing? Uh, but also the, the improbability of the whole thing. And part of that recognition of how strange everything is, um, is it, it, it makes me feel that all our theories, our ideas, mm. uh, our expressions, our responses to this, this crazy mystery are completely inadequate. They fall so far short of what's actually going on. And yet, you know, we have to keep trying. And this is where, you know, this is what science is doing. It's philosophy and religion and, and, uh, and all the arts are trying to do. But it seems to me that there should be this recognition that there's this field in, in uh, theology called negative theology uh, that I love. Um, I wrote about it in my book, Rational Mysticism. Uh, the idea is that 
the fundamental assumption of negative theology is God is that which can never possibly be ex described. And so then you go on from there right. and you try to describe God after saying that what you're trying to do is absolutely impossible. I think whether or not you believe in God, um, that's a good attitude to keep in mind. Let's say if you're a philosopher or a scientist or a writer, that you're always going to, for you can never capture, capture reality. You can't capture a single person uh, with language and with scientific models. Um, and, and, but then that's what we do. You know, we, 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 uh, we try to figure it out. Always fail. This reminded me of a psychedelic experience I had myself, two actually. Uh, and, but, but one in particular, when you're talking about the inability to express the thing that we're trying to express, I had this experience on mushrooms with two of my friends where like it started out with just laughter and I'm not entirely sure what the cause of the laughter was, but by the time that sort of like spasm of laughter ended, I was just making sort of monkey noises. <laughs> and then we proceeded to have a conversation, but I was, I still feel like I maybe have gotten something right at that moment. I was pretty confident that if we want to describe the thing that is worth, if we want to discuss the thing that is worth actually paying attention to, like the actual substance of life, then we should not go away from the monkey noises. That's our best chance <laughs> to actually communicate about this inexpressible thing. Because as soon as we start putting these sentences together, well, we're going to get trapped in the construction, in the language construction. And in a, in a couple of minutes, you're not talking about the actual thing anymore. You're talking about these things that you've constructed from words. And uh, yeah. that, that was met with some resistance from my interlocutor <laughs> because he wasn't, he wasn't feeling we're getting anywhere, I think. But so eventually, I, like, we compromised. And I said, okay, we can use single words. Like you can say a noun and I'll reply with a different noun, but I'm not going to go into this whole sentence bullshit. And, uh, and he would sometimes go, he would like produce a sentence or two and I would miss this point of departure, but then catch him and go like, no, you're doing this motherfucking thing again. Where I'm going <laughs> to go back to the monkey noises if you continue with this language game. <laughs> that sounds like a great trick. <laughs> As long as it's fun, you know. Um, yeah, I. So as you know, I I, um, I finally uh, gave in to uh, Bob Wright, our mutual friend, um, you know, the guy who operates this site, Meaning of Life, and and went on a silent Buddhist retreat this summer, and and um, I appreciated as I never have before. Uh, how enlightenment is the state of being content right where you are. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start thinking, I've got to describe this, mm -hmm. I've got to try to figure it out, or even um, I'm not happy with my emotional state right now, I, I'd rather be in this different emotional state. As soon as there's any dissatisfaction with the moment that you're in, um, including just a kind of questioning of it, um, then it's gone. The enlightenment is gone. And I get that. And I think I, you know, I, I'd like to have more of those experiences. But to me, chasing after the mystery is the whole point of life, mm -hmm. too. So if enlightenment means being totally content and not thinking, what the fuck is going on, uh, then I don't want to be enlightened. I'm, you know, I get my, my greatest pleasure in life is trying to figure out stuff and then talking to other people like you are also trying to figure it out and going, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm totally clueless. How about you? And yeah, no, I'm totally clueless too. <laughs> you know, it's a great way, especially if you can kind of get paid for it. Mm -hmm. It's really a fantastic way to live a life. You know, you're going to have some heartbreak because people aren't going to be as interested in the things you're saying as you might like. But, um, if you can squeak by, make a living doing it, it's fantastic. <laughs> Better than in life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had a, I feel like we're, we're getting into this part of the conversation where it's just story time and, uh, you know, 
exchange and tales of psychedelic confusion. Maybe not necessarily psychedelic. Um, but what you just said reminded me of a different trip that I had. With Have you ever done DMT? I know you've done ayahuasca recently. I've only done DMT in the form of mm -hmm. ayahuasca, and I, I did it twice, and including just last May. I, so I want to talk, ask you about that, uh, but just to tail onto the, uh, the thing that you just said. I had this one, not even the whole experience, it was like a two seconds at the beginning of a trip that changed my relationship to the Buddhist idea of dukkha, what they call suffering or unsatisfactoriness, or I think it originally comes, I think the etymology of the word has to do with, it's like a bent on an axis of a, like a carriage or something. Like if you imagine uh, a carriage with four wheels and one of the axes just has like a little bent on it, then the carriage is always going to be a little fucked up. And, yeah. and that's, I think that's the, the like uh, etymology of the word dukkha. It re re refers to that situation. And uh, as far as I understand in the Buddhist tradition, it's viewed as the fundamental kind of quality of life. There's always this thing that's, something's always wrong some there's something to chase after or something to change or fix or want um and the way it usually is presented at least from what i've seen in like kind of commentary in english or russian you know when i don't know if an enlightened buddhist teacher would put it differently but very often uh, these kind of like introductory texts or lectures or whatever talk about this thing as a problem like it's there's there's always suffering in life and here's how we can get here's the causes of it and here's how we can get rid of it and I always kind of struggle with that just because I have a natural kind of resistance to big theories that start out with everything's wrong. Like I don't want my life to be more problematic. Like to, to pose it as a problem at the very beginning is I have, I have some resistance towards that, but that's how I interpreted this thing until I had this trip where at the very beginning, there was like a short second um, that changed my relationship to that. So DMT, if you if you do it uh, not in the form of ayahuasca, but if you smoke the pure thing, it's a very short experience. It's like 15 to 20 minutes, but it's very intense. It's very rich visually, and it's a complete like overload of everything from visual information. There are all kinds of just bright color details, and you can't catch everything. Everything is, is in constant flux. And then it's also imbued with all this meaning and emotional uh component to it and everything but in the first second of that trip so before all of this intensity started i had this so i took the first the the, the it usually take like three tokes to go into this complete departure from everyday life and i took the third toke and i laid back on the bed and immediately i was in a this hyperspace, this completely different reality. And I was not aware anymore that I have a body or that I'm in a room, but I did have a sense that I'm in some sort of a place and that I'm laying down. And walking away from me was this cartoon, like cartoonish princess, like, uh, like what's her name? Jasmine in Aladdin. Something like, like uh, Eastern a cartoonish princess was walking away from me and she looked over her shoulder at me and smiled and it all takes like a fraction of a second and I was just in a different reality and suddenly there's already a different person and she's walking away from me which implies that she used to be next to me and I'm laying down what is my relationship to this woman and why is she walking away what is that smile is she is it a sympathetic smile or is she laughing at me and what is where is she gonna go now should I chase after her all of these questions appear in the split second 
and they you know bother me I, I try to grasp onto something to figure out what i do in this situation and then in the next fraction of a second i realize that is the beauty of the experience it's like it's like uh you know beginning of a relationship if you meet a girl and you really like her and you think she likes you back but you're not sure and you don't know what's going to happen next but you just had a good day and you don't need to know the exact future of how it's going to evolve and whether it's going to evolve you can just enjoy the day you've just had and in that second in that trip i realized that yeah there's always this thing about life there's something to fix or something to chase after and some sort of incompleteness to the whole thing but that's not a bug to me that's like if you didn't have that if world could be completed well then we would complete it and then it's over and then you can continue playing the game you know it it's by the way that is i love talking about <laughs> trips that's an amazing vision and the question is what you, you do with these things what i came out of this i had this one big trip in 1981 where i was in a trance state for about i don't know maybe 16 or 18 hours and just total visions i didn't know where I was and this is when I I thought you know for a while I I became God and and uh and I I thought of God as being in this kind of loop chasing himself somehow uh trying to catch up to himself and trying to understand himself so in a way it was sort of mental and physical seeking comprehension but also like physically chasing and and at some point i realized that if you ever caught up everything would vanish mm -hmm. that that this chase was the reason for existence and um you know we're all manifestations of god chasing himself and so when i came out of this and you know it it i for this trip really rocked me i was having flashbacks for about maybe 6 months and um i was completely alienated from everybody around me i just didn't know how to describe it and especially because i thought i had discovered the secret of the universe uh -huh. that's always that's, that's always a red flag yes definitely and i i was actually fearful 